All right, everybody, welcome back to Applied Perspective. Instructor Phil Dimitratis here. I just have to say that because it's on the recorder. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to show you guys the basics on how to make a portfolio page. Um, I've showed you some samples already from other students, and I'll go over that again, and I'll show you why these notebooks were A's, um, why they worked so well. Okay, so... Here's a base notebook. Let me see if I can shrink this down. This is from the awesome and super talented uh, Michael Seminio. Okay, so basically every topic that we covered is here in the notebook. Okay, right now we're on I think topic 32. We've skipped one little topic, so that means we still have quite a bit. We have 50 more topics to cover, so we're going to pick up the pace in the next couple weeks as we uh, go into November. Okay, to finish up here. All right. Um, but they're easier topics, and a lot of them overlap each other. But if you look here, so first of all, the first thing you're going to see that's correct is he's labeled the section according to the, the, the section layout that I put on the blog, right? I gave you 1 through 80 topics. I might add a couple in there. But if I look at 3, and then I see transferring scale and one-point perspective, the notes are there. Some students didn't do that. Those are the students that did not get an A on their notebooks. Those are the students that might have got a C or D on their notebooks. In fact, some students, I would just grab the notebook and I looked at it and I would just go and count the pages, turned in 25 pages. Well, we have 80 topics, one topic a page, and that's not all including, remember I mentioned yesterday, or excuse me, the last class meeting, that if you did on a particular topic, let's say two-point perspective, let's say it was page 16, you could have 16A, 16B, 16C, three other pages because you might have thumbnails, you might have some other notes you put in there, you might have a finished drawing that go on top of the, the topic. Okay, that's totally fine. I go through every one of your notebooks and I check everything. I do. It takes me a long time. But I go through and then I have a little post-it and I will put a post-it on a part of your notebook that has something wrong. So if you think that you can get away with a particular topic or you didn't draw it right, I will catch it. I go through everybody. I know we have a lot of students in this class. We had 32 at the beginning. And I go through, that's 32 times 80 pages. And I go through every single page, okay, and check it. All right? So look, everything's there and the perspective is correct. The height relationships, um, the basic directions that I gave, and so everything, and I know we've we've only gotten to, let me scroll down in this PDF here. I know some of you, like here's an example of your, you know, one-point perspective environment. That's the environment that you did. Um, we talked about foreground, midground, and depth. That was a little sloppy. I think I nailed them on that traceover. I'm like, that's not a traceover, Michael. Mine is three points, right? That's just a couple lines going to vanishing point. In the traceover, I told you guys I wanted to see boxes and cubes and how they overlap each other. Okay? So we scroll down here. Um, a little bit later, that's where we are now, right? That's a topic we just covered. Okay, we talked about center lines, additive and subtractive methods of drawing. All right, and then we get down in here. We start, now we're talking about bugs. We're talking about drawing a bug and representing that from a reverse angle. Then we're going to be talking about ellipses and how ellipses work in perspective. Okay, then we'll talk about how to draw a tire, how to do barrels, okay, and then we're going to get into three-point perspective, up shots, down shots, okay, five-point perspective and how that works, and then we'll be talking a little bit about pans, how to set up a horizontal three-point perspective pan, okay, an upward pan, a vertical pan shot, okay, uh, we're going to talk about drawing on hills and plains, Okay, and then after that, we're going to get to lighting. So lighting's great. Talking about how shadows cast from natural light, artificial light. Okay, so there's a lot of time in this notebook. There's great examples in here. Okay, we're going to talk about the equator and how shadows change depending where you are in the world. Okay, so all this is great information we're going to be covering. So if you're at a point after today's class where you've only done like two pages on the notebook, you're falling behind drastically because we're at the midpoint of the class, right? So uh, it's going to go by really quickly. We have the whole month of November, and then December we have the first two weeks and we're done. It'll sneak up on you. You have other finals to do. 
Start spending some time on the next couple weekends and get fully caught up. I'd say by the end of the next week, we'll probably be on page going towards 4045. So that means you should probably have be on page 45 in your notebook and have that finished, okay? Uh, don't print out your notebook yet. Wait, because sometimes we go in and we add a section or two. There's nothing wrong with that, so you might have to go in and change your notebook. Have your notebook saved, and that, that's what I'm going to talk about in today's demo, in Photoshop files, all right? So I'm going to cover the basics on how do you create a base Photoshop file. We're going to create a base frame similar to this, and then create one typeface, and then that way you open up the same file, and I'm going to show you a little method that I use and even the artwork that I present. Because whenever I work on a show, if I have to present artwork, I have a base frame that all my sketches or drawings go into. So I'm going to cover a little bit of that with you right now. Um, Jameson was kind enough to send us three of his images. So I want you to see what his page system looks like right now. Okay, it looks fantastic. One point perspective assignment. There's his assignment in there. He has the topic number, topic 21, and he has the page number that might be relative to his notebook. Okay, really simple. That's his, his uh, now title perspective lesson. So obviously he hasn't gone in there and put two-point perspective yet, but he will. That's his homework from yesterday or Monday. It's already in his page. They already put it in there. Okay, it's a great way to work. He's finishing his pages as he goes. Okay, his homework's in there. Um, I could be picky and say, put shading on one side. That's just me being really picky. But it's a nice presentation right there. So this is a great example where in every one of these three examples here, Jameson has a sample of the environment of the perspective that we talked about that was traditionally drawn, and then he has the outline here. So what does that mean? He's using a scanner somewhere. If you don't know how to use a scanner, they're pretty simple. I can We could go upstairs next week and I could show you how to scan an image. It's pretty easy to scan an image. Most scanners will either save the image, depending on the scanner system, as a JPEG, TIFF, or PSD file. You then bring that in and import it in your Photoshop image. That's it. That's simple. So let's go to Photoshop now. This is what it looks like when you open up a Photoshop in a window. I can't blah, 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 blah. can't talk right now. Sorry, I'm losing my voice for some reason. So when you open up Photoshop, this is the base default that you're going to see, right? So we need to go in there and tell it the document we want to create. To do that, we're going to go under File. We're going to go down to New. And then up pops up this little window. There are presets already given inside this window right here. To find a good preset, just clip up here. US Paper is always there. Click US Paper. It's on Tabloid right now. Tabloid is 11 by 17. Legal is 8.5 by 14. Okay. So I want to go down to Letter. Letter is 8.5 by 11. Now, 300 DPI, that's a high-res DPI, which is great for printing high-caliber work from what we would call real-life print. So magazines, real-life publications, printed 300 DPI. If you save every one of your images as 300 DPI, every time you send it to the printer, you're going to be waiting like this, sitting there for multiple minutes because it's a larger file. I don't think you need to have a 300 DPI file. You can. It's your preference. Okay. What you can do is you can lower this down to like 200 DPI. Okay. However, though, let me go back and talk about file structure real quick. Your Photoshop file is going to have multiple layers in it. When I work, I create three different files. So this is how your structure should be. Create a folder. Call it Art243F. That's this class. Inside that, open up another folder and call this notebook. Okay. When you open up that folder in here, you want to have three other folders, okay, that are going to save you a lot of time. You want to call this, uh, what do I, call? I, this is how I do it. Sometimes they even have a whole another one. Oops. Um, let's just call this extras right now. I end up inside here having four folders in here. 
One is called my work. That means my, that's what I call my working file. That's my key Photoshop file that's working, meaning that it has multiple layers in it and it might be 300 DPI, right? I have another file in here. I call it my for print file. Print right there. That's when I go to print and I save my images as JPEGs that are lower res so they're ready to go to print. Because if I go to a printer and try to send a 300 DPI fully layered Photoshop file through, I might be waiting at that printer for five to 10 minutes. Versus if I send a 100 DPI flattened image that's a JPEG, I'm gonna wait maybe 30 seconds. See the difference? Okay, so the negative side for you is that when you're working, and I'll cover this in a minute here, and you flatten your Photoshop file, you can't ever go back into it and make any changes. Well, changes always happen. So it's a good idea to have this sort of workflow. Then I have another folder, which would be my scans. Whenever I scan something, okay? Then I have another folder, sometimes I call extras. An extra would be any, any extra information, uh, scans, materials, something else I might want to include in my notebook that's different there. Okay, that's on my desktop now. We're going to come back to that in one minute, right? So when I first open up my Photoshop file, file, new, 911 by 17, we go to US paper, go to legal, it's 8.5 by 11. Now, look at the width and the height here. I prefer to have my notebook the other way. Let's say you hit OK right now. I don't want it this way. If you go under image, okay, and if we go down to image rotation, 90 degrees, that's the way you want to have your notebook. That's easier to view when it's turned horizontal and not vertical format. Okay, so what I'm going to do really quick here is I'm going to make a base layout page. Really simple. So I'm going to come in here. Now I have one base layer on the side here that's filled with white. You can see it filled with white. If for some reason you open up Photoshop and you don't have this window right here. Oh my God, the layers aren't there. What do I do? You go over here to Window and you scroll down and you find Layers. Hotkey is F7. Click that button, there are the layers. If you drag the layers, you can drag them over. Hold them over in the tab bar and there they pop up. Okay, I come down here to the very bottom, Photoshop. I'm going to click and add some extra layers in there, okay? This layer I'm going to label is going to be called my frame. To make something that looks nice, I'm going to grab the marquee tool, which is this little box. I'm just going to come over here. I'm going to hold down about, let's say, about yay big, okay? I like to add a little bit more leading on the bottom, meaning a little bit more space on the bottom, and then the sides are about equal, okay? I can adjust that in a minute. I'm going to come over here. Let's say I decide to do this in a dark gray. I hate this color wheel, by the way. Someone changed this. Uh, I don't know what the default is. I always forget. So what that does. Somebody was messing with stuff in here, and I hate it. Now I can't get my color schemes. What's the default? Anyone know? Anyway, that, that's fine for now. So let's say that's gray. I can go to a darker gray somewhere about right in there, okay? And hit OK. So here's my color is that dark gray. I put that little line around there. I'm going to say edit. I'm going to tell it's a stroke. Stroke is going to put a little line around that box. I hit OK. Deselect. Boom. That's it. That's simple. There's my box. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to hit the T, the button T, which is for type. I'm going to come over here, and I might put the topic here. So I might put sample topic. That's a little hard to read, right? So I'm going to select this right now. Oops. Do that by clicking on the layer, select it. I'm going to raise this from 12 point to about 18 point so I can see the topic that might be listed. Really simple, right? Then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put the steps. Step number one, blah, blah, okay? 
Here we go. Oops. I hit the exclamation point by accident. There we go. Step number one. Okay, type. Oops. I accidentally touched here, it created a new type layer. I don't want that. I just right click on it till it to delete layer. So I'm going to come back here now. Then I'm going to put number two right after that and put number three. Okay. These are the steps that I've been giving you in class. All right. Now, that's readable to me, but I still want the sample topic to be a little bit larger. So I'm going to select it. I'm going to raise that to about 24% so I can see what it is. Maybe I decide to put this in, actually, let me see what this typeface has. It does have a bold condensed. There we go. All right. Okay. So now I have the steps. The last thing I'm going to do is put my page number. So I can do that really easily. Look, see this layer right here? The, the blah, blah, blah. If I want that exact, I can just right click on this layer, tell it to duplicate. Bring that down. Go back to type. And put PG1. Hit this the move tool right here. And then I can move that, put it right down here on the bottom of the book. That's it. That's simple. That's my base page. Now when I save this file, save as. Now you don't have to put your name on every page. You're going to have a cover page, right? You're going to tell me who you are. You don't have to come down here. I had one student on every page put copyright <laughs> Denzel. And then it had his blog. And then it had his email address. And then it had his website. Overkill. It's a perspective notebook. You don't need that, right? Now when I save this though, Okay, I'm going to go back to my desktop. Remember that folder structure? Notebook. Okay, I'm going to save this here first, and I'm going to call this the outline. Save. Okay, so the reason why I just did that, you guys, is when I come over here and look at notebook, there's my outline. I don't want to save over my outline. I want to be able to pull that up every time and then create a new page. So now I'm going to come back here. Let's say that I'm working on my notebook. And I say one. Oops. Yeah. One point perspective. And then I label all this information. And then I'm going to put an image in here. Some of you might be like, well, how do I get an image in there? Well, that's actually pretty easy. I'm going to pretend right now. Actually, I have something on my desktop here. Let's say this bug here is my drawing. So how do I get that in? Well, there's a couple different ways you can get that in in Photoshop. One is you can come over here to File, and you can go to Place. And then it'll ask me, where do you want to go? I'm going to Desktop, grab my image, hit Place. Boom, there it is. But when it places it, the places it in is a file that I can't transform or anything right now because it hasn't been rasterized. I mean, I could transform it, but I can't manipulate it or adjust it anyway. So to rasterize that, I come over, and you can see the, the file, the layer has this little indication on it, right, in the box there. If you right-click on it, tell it to rasterize layer. Now, if I wanted to, if it's too dark or whatever, I can manipulate it inside Photoshop, okay? So let's say there's my artwork. Now, where would I find if I do place? I know exactly where to go. I go to my scan folder because that's where all my scans are that I labeled, right? Right. We work consistently. A couple questions popped up. Nathan was first. Um, for the folders, does it have to be organized exactly like you have it? Because the way I have it, I just have one folder entitled fill stuff, and then I put updated and then the actual one. However you want to do it is up to you, but I would highly recommend that you do end up having a main file and a print file because you're going to save images when they're so what I'm getting at is look at how many layers I have here right now see that I don't want to send that to print mm -hmm. that's going to take longer to print so watch so Eric you had a question yeah so um, let's say you delete the original photo for that photo because that rasterized photo If I delete the once it's in the Photoshop file, it's you're fine. Okay. So I could go on my desktop and delete the image on my desktop, 
As long as it's in Photoshop, it's fine. Yeah, but sometimes if I place an image and I delete the original image, it disappears. Well, or misplaced. That's actually that shouldn't be Photoshop. That should be their InDesign does that, and some other programs do that. Photoshop once it's in the document, it's it's a pixel. It's an item in that document. It should no longer. I've never seen that happen in Photoshop. It's there. Once it's imported in, you've brought in a grouping of pixels th that are placed in there. It's done. Okay. So watch. I'm going to save this now. File. Save as. So I'm going to come over here to my little folder, right? Now, remember, I told you I had my working files. That's how I call it, my work or working files. I do this with everything. I do it with my concept art, with my Maya files. It saves me so much time. So now I'm going to click on working files. And I'm going to save this. It's not outline anymore. It's page, let's say two. Page save. Okay. So what's great about that, if I come look at my working file right here, work, there's page two. Then would be page three. But now when I go to print, I don't want to grab that file to print. Right? So this is what I do. I come back to Photoshop. I'm going to come in here, file, save as. I'm going to go back to notebook. I'm going to go to for print, which is my JPEGs, for print. I'm going to print. And now under format, I'm going to scroll down and say JPEG and hit save. Hit OK. All right. Let's come back here and look now. Notebook. My working files. PSD. Let's select that image right now. Let's say get info. That was a 300 DPI image. That one image right there is 16.9 megabytes on a disk. It's a good size image. You can email that image. It will be rejected by most servers. And then that means every time I send that image to a printer, that printer has to process 16.9 megabytes. Okay. However, if I come back here, go to my for print, and I click on that and say get info, that's 2 megabytes. You see the difference in the importance? That's 200 megabytes saved as a JPEG, and I didn't even adjust the DPI. And so if I wanted to get technical, come back here, go to image, image size. Now, here's what you don't want to do. I don't want to do this in the working file. I want to do this in the Photoshop file. Because if I come in here and change this to 100 DPI, and then save it, I've officially lowered my DPI from 24 megabytes to 2.68. If I accidentally save over it, it's there, and it'll never change back. I've lost the, the full res of that. It won't print right, right? So what you want to do, and this gets confusing. What is this file right here? That's a PSD, right? That's correct. I'm going to go to my 4 print. I'm going to open that image now. That's a JPEG. There's a difference there. It's a different file format. So when I click on my JPEG now, all my layers are flattened. Do you see that? Most common mistake by students using Photoshop is they accidentally merge layers, flatten objects. There's no going in here and adjusting my blah, blah, blah. If I forgot to put step one and two, it's gone. I can't go back in there. Why? It's a JPEG. It's flattened. Okay. However, though, what I can do if I come under image and image size, that's 300 DPI. It's telling me it's 24 megabytes. I could put this down to 150 DPI. Then file save as. I'm going to save it next to this. I'm going to put a dash after it so we see the difference. Dash 2, right? JPEG, save. You always get this window up. Don't do small file. I usually keep it just at large. Hit OK. Now let's go back here to the notebook. So. The key one, this one here was the first one I saved as a JPEG. That's still only 2 megabytes as compared to 16.9. Now the one I just saved where I altered the DPI a little bit, and I open that up, okay, that's 803, excuse me, 807 kilobytes. So that's even, that's half the size now of the original file by me adjusting. Yes? If you change a JPEG, like let's say you save it out as a JPEG, then changed it back to a PSD, would you get all your no. years back or no? 
No. Once you flatten the image and it's saved as a JPEG, it's gone. You've killed all the layers. That's why the fills method of showing you, okay, and I do this, I especially do this with my concept art, right? <coughs> That's why I label my files this way. I always have a working file. I always have a for print file. I'm saving you anguish. You should all come up and give me a hug. I'm saving you years of anguish and pain and suffering where you will save over your file, come back and go, that, 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 because you have to go in and change something or your director says, oh, I like this art direction page, but you misspelled factory or you misspelled this when you're typing it real quick. Oh, no, but you saved it as a JPEG. You didn't save a working file of layers and text files. It's gone. Okay, so then as I'm reading my notebook, and if I come over here, and if I look at my for print file, and I pull it up, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to put in the directions. Well, it's really easy now. I just come back here. I go to working. I pull up that file. All my layers are there on the right side. I go find blah, blah, blah. I touch blah, blah, blah. Now I touch it, and I type in the rules. You must have one VP. Okay, now that's done. Now it's a little, this is the part that sucks, is I know you have to save it twice. Because now you have to save the main file as PSD, save, that's correct, hit OK. Then you have to go back and save over the JPEG, right, notebook, for print, there's the JPEG, Photoshop, JPEG, save, place. But then that's still the high res JPEG. But still, I'd rather send, you're still fine sending that to a printer. Okay? I'd rather send a 2 megabyte file to the printer than a 16.9 megabyte. Okay? Some of you don't realize this. I don't know if I have this one file. I, here, let me show you chaos. Okay? Let me see if I have it here. I might have it. So I know this is just for a notebook right now. Okay, but let me show you an image that I worked on. Let me see if it's even on this drive. Um, nope, give me a second. Eject this drive. I'm trying to save you time and effort, and you have to be organized and structured when you're working with Photoshop or dealing with printing. You have to be. If you're not, let's see what I have on here. I think I have it in this folder. See, these are all, I saved them as JPEGs. So this is the one I'm looking for, this little piece I did. Let me see if I find it down here. Rough comps at school, false preferences. Um, This also, part of this lecture, there's another lecture I've done on here, deals with making what we call portfolio pages. So part of this lecture ties into that a little bit. Then when you make a portfolio page, here I'll click on one that I have here. This is how I make my portfolio pages to go right in my book. And I already have a lecture on there. I have a bunch of work and comps that I've done. And this page would be a tonal study page. Actually, this lecture is loaded up on the blog already on, on YouTube there. And this is how I took a bunch of tonal comps I did and then how I made this nice little layout page. <clears throat> really similar, but see, look, I have all my layers here, all my options there, and then I save that as a JPEG for print. But then I could go back any time and I could adjust anything that needs to be in here. See all these images? They're all separate. They all have different, um, they're all different layers. Nothing's merged to flatten down. So if I decide later, hey, I really don't like this layer down here on the bottom, I can just take layer eight, take it out, put another image in there really quickly, right? Right. Okay, so that's a benefit of what I'm teaching to you today. So what I'm going over isn't just about um, these, just your pages as notebook, but it's also how you work as an artist. And it's the progression of saving your files correctly. Um, hold on, I wanted to show you this one that I have. I got to see if it's there. 
Um, there's so much work here. All finals, one point. Speed paints, let's see this. Nope. So the image I was gonna show you is, that's not it. I had it here in my CSUF folder. So I'm just gonna bring up the low res image. So this image right here in Photoshop. So I did that, that was like an experiment for me because that's multiple things happening in there. I modeled those ships in Maya, brought them in as a 3D render. The, the back mountains are actual photographed mountains from China that I've then expanded on the photo. I then, all these ships were modeled in Maya. I then painted all the textures, photo blended all the textures on top. The, the water layer is rendered in Maya. The shadows are done digitally in Photoshop. So this was uh, an attempt for me, it is experimentation, I should say, at creating a piece of concept art that was created off of using multiple aspects. It has digital photo bashing. It has a digital photo in it. It has Maya in it. It has a Maya render of a water layer. So I was trying to combine multiple things to see what I could come up with, okay? This Photoshop file has like 65 layers on it. I know, it's maddening, but I didn't, I kept all my, these ships have their layers. These ships have their layers. The water layers separate. The cloud layers are separate. Everything is separate. And I kept it that way. When I open up that file, it takes like 10 minutes for Photoshop to open it because it's so freaking big. If I took that Photoshop file and tried to print that at Kinko's, the Kinko staff would kill me right there because they would send it to the printer. It's a 250 megabyte file. And you see how wide it is? It's 300 DPI at 11 by like 36. It's huge. Okay? So that would not be in my best interest to try to send that. Some of you might have already have done that. You're making a huge mistake sending a fully layered Photoshop file to the printer. It's not going to work. Yes, sir? Uh, what did you use to render it? Like Maya software, Maya hardware 2.0? Well, no, I used Maya... I think when I did this, it was Maya 10 or 11 at that time that rendered the water layer. But then I painted the textures on top of that. So I I don't have it with me, but uh, let me see. I had a sample of, no, um, I don't know if I have it with me. I had a sample of how I put it together in the stages. And I don't have that with me right now. Okay, um, let's see what's here. No, I don't have that with me, unfortunately. On this drive, I don't, okay? So, but I, I could always show you that another time because I worked in phases to get there. I worked in, I did a rough block in, I had a photo block, and I took it through that whole process, okay? Anyway, so back to this, all right? That's how you construct up your one page. Now, some of you are gonna put your, your notebooks together a little differently. Some of you might put it in an IOTA folder. So an IOTA folder looks like this, and it comes with a certain amount of pages in the middle that are already in there, and that's where you slide the page in the, in the sleep. If you do that, that's fine. I left my notebook upstairs in my office by accident, but you guys saw my notebook, it has a spiral bound through it. So what you can do is you can take all your pages here, take them to Kinko's, and for like three or four bucks, they will put, put it on a machine, and they will punch a series of holes. Hold on a minute, let me show you. Along this top edge right here. If you do that, it is in your best interest to prepare for that. So what you need to do is this layer here, that's your frame layer. If you hit transform, you should bring that down to about here. Why? Because there's gonna be holes being riddled in right there. Does that make sense? Let me give you the example of Bonas sketchbook right here. It is a punch-bound book that has a spiral in it. The spiral comes down a quarter inch into the page. Does that make sense? Okay. Do not, do not give me your perspective notebook and have a nice line then with holes riddled all through it where the spiral bind goes. That wouldn't be a good idea. So it's a good idea to think about how you want to present your notebook at this point, right? 
If you present it and you take it to Kinko's and you get the little tops for it, that's totally fine. Or if you want to put it, if I'm going to put it in the sleeves, I don't have to do that. I can hit Command Z. I can go all the way to the edges. Okay. Now, um, I made a comment on something, something I learned here from Dr. Booth. So my framing here on the top and the sides is all equal. Do you see that? Really good presentations and graphic design, you tend to give a little bit more letting and space on the bottom. It gives weight to the page. It makes it feel anchored. So you see this bottom area from here to here? There's a little bit more space there than is the sides. By doing that, it makes it feel better. Okay? Any questions? Is Kinko's Spanish? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I still call it Kinko's because it's been Kinko's ever since I was an art student. Then FedEx bought them out. Now it's called FedEx. Though they called it FedEx Kinko's for a while. Then they finally stripped the name to FedEx. Okay? All right. So any questions about the notebook page and the basics on how to cover it? I did show you quickly how to put an image in there, right? One was by placing. Well, there's also a couple other ways. On a Mac, if you click an image like this, once it gets into preview here, you can select over the area that you want, hit Command-C to copy, go back to your Photoshop document, and hit Paste. It's the bottom one. And when it pastes it in, it's pasted it and it's already rasterized it for you. So you don't have to tell it to rasterize. And then you can hit transform and then you can enlarge it accordingly to how it fits in your page and you're done. Okay? That's another way. Now on a, on a PC, if you have one at home, you don't have quite that option, but you do have something similar called print screen, depending what type of keyboard you have. Print screen means control copy. And then you come back to Photoshop, hit Command-V to paste, and it'll paste the command that you just put in there that was the image that was opened up. Unfortunately, Windows sort of sucks because they don't have a, a direct viewing option like Window Viewer or anything that allows you to copy right from it and then bring it in. That's what I like about Preview is I can do my pages very quickly. Okay? All right. So hopefully there's no other discussions about that. You guys don't have any questions. What's really important is that I just wanted to go over sort of this. You keep your scans separate. You know where they are. You have them labeled. You have your print file ready because that's for, actually, I call it for print. Let me just highlight it here. The reason I call it for print, like I said, is I know that's where my lower res sizes are, and then that's the file that I'm ready to. Now, when you go to print this, you do have a couple options. You could save all your images as a PDF. So does anyone in here know how to do that? When you end up saving, this folder for print will have like 80 images in it, right? In Photoshop, if you go and just type in on YouTube, and I can show you how to do it too, it's pretty simple. If you want to create a PDF, what you do is you go down inside Photoshop here. And I would say file. And what I could do is go to PDF presentation right there. Automate and PDF presentation. When you click that, it will bring up and ask you where all the files are. And if I go back then to my for print, as long as they're in numerical order, it'll place them all in numerical order. It'll give me the option to save it as a high res, low res, or, or a print res PDF. And then you hit yes, it'll ask you where you want to save it, and you hit it, and then Photoshop will go in and organize all those into one PDF readable document, so then you could walk into Kinko's or whatever and take that and give it to them. And that's if you want to do that. That's an easier way to how you print mass amounts of information, okay? If you want to print them one by one, because your mom has a super awesome printer at home that really works great, you can use that printer too. It's up to you, okay? All right, let me stop the recorder. Any other questions? Before we wrap it up and end the recorder, nope, good. You all know how to make a portfolio page, I mean a, a simple presentation page for your notebook, okay? And then I would just repeat the same page. You don't have to get fancy. I had a student once to put like dotted lines down here, broken up with a zigzag pattern, and then his name blended in sideways. It didn't get him any extra points, okay? And it didn't make the notebook pages pass in terms of
The, the information has to be correct in the pages. I check your perspective and your notes. And again, the reason why this is important is some of you in here, a couple years from now, who can I pick on? Nathan, I picked on Nathan earlier. Okay, Rachel will be working on a children's book for somebody. And then she's going to get a rough outline from the publisher. And in that, in that it's going to say page 21 and then 24 have to be an upshot and a downshot. And then she's going to go, oh my gosh, I don't remember how to do an upshot and a downshot. So then she's going to pull up her little handy notebook. She's going to look in there. And then she's going to remember how to set up a, a, an upshot and a downshot. And then she's going to email me and say, thanks, Phil. I just had to do an upshot and downshot. And I forgot how to do it. And, your, and the perspective book we created in class reminded me how to do it. I've gone to my book many times back and forth. Yes, sir? Sure. Um, the border's not mandatory. I'm just putting it up there to outline the information on the topic. If you have your pages set up, just remember, though, the only reason I like the border is because it reminds me that there is what's called a bleed. So when you go to print, right, there's a certain part of this that won't print. So let's, not to go into too much detail here, but let's just say we we're going to print this now. File. Actually, do I even have, I do have the print. Document. I know this isn't hooked up to a printer. This is the next important phase is to understand the print setup. Right now, if I went to print that, what's the problem? No, it's not set up. I got to tell the printer how it's going to print. So I have to come down here, print settings. Okay. I have to tell what printer it's going to go to. Details. Aha. Layout. Letter. Make sure it's on the right paper size. Okay. And then scroll down. Position size. Center. That's fine. But... It's still printing not at the right size. So look, vertical, horizontal. Ah, yes. Now I've turned the paper. I've told it to print vertically. However, though, the next important option is right here. If I print that page right now, page one is going to fall off the printer. It's in the bleeded area where the printer doesn't quite print on. So I have to hit scale to fit media. That now scales in everything you have and tells the printer don't print any information off the page that will get cropped or unprinted. Okay, that's it. I'm now ready to go. Let's say for some reason you wanted to scale it even more. I could come here and say 85%. Aha, look at that. I could even manually adjust it to make sure. Okay, and then I can print it now. That's really key. A lot of students screw that up. Don't, don't screw that up, okay? And if I hit print right now, it would be done. It would print. It would be that easy, okay? So remember, uh, paper size, format, either vertical or horizontal, scale to fit media has to be checked next, okay? All right. Thank you. Let me stop the recorder.